spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down flights till i'm found leaves the night I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God When I was your foe, still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me love of God Oh, it chases me down flights till I'm found leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away All the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Welcome to worship at Incarnation Church. We're so glad that you have found us, whether uh, this be through something that you normally do or whether you're just scrolling through YouTube and looking for uh, a new worship component. Welcome. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. My name is Joel Vanderwall. I'm one of the pastors here at Incarnation. And just a couple of announcements as we begin worship. Uh, our Kairos uh, Adult Learning Forum that's going to be happening. Our first event is happening this Tuesday, October 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be having uh, Luther Seminary Professor Dwight Sheely talk to us and share with us uh, some of the ideas and things that are going on in, in his life. So we encourage you to sign up for that online. You can visit our church website in order to sign up for that event. So hopefully you join us for that as well. Our stewardship campaign has begun. Our theme this year is I'm in, as in I'm into incarnation. I'm into what God is doing through this community of faith and what God is doing through me specifically in order to reach others with God's grace and love. And so there's three parts to this stewardship campaign. The first is a commitment for prayer and encouragement. So we ask that you would pray for this community, that you would pray for the people in it, that you would pray for the ministries that are a part of it, that you would pray for our ministry partners that we connect with, uh, and for all those who are experiencing hardship during this time. So please pray for people. Uh, maybe write people a letter of encouragement or a note, just letting them know that you're praying for them. The second thing is a financial commitment that we're asking for you to make, whether that be for our capital campaign uh, to pay for the building loan that we still are paying off or to pay for the ongoing ministries that happen, um, the operating fund. And so we ask that you would fill out those commitments online um, there's uh, going to be a letter that will be sent to those who don't have access online, or you can follow the link at the bottom of this email uh, that you received. And just click on that link and you'll be able to start filling out that commitment card. And finally, the third uh, part of this that we asked for uh, is just a commitment to serve. And so along with a 
financial commitment along with a spiritual commitment. We ask for a commitment to serve, to use the gifts that God has given you in order to bring about God's kingdom, a glimpse of God's kingdom here on earth. And so that may be serving here at church or that may be serving out in the wider community. Um, We just ask that you make a commitment to serve in some way. And there's a service form that uh, you can find on our website that will help you uh, fill that out uh, more completely. Lastly, uh, Every week now, we're going to start looking at videos of people telling their stories of ways that, uh, that they say, I'm in to what God is doing in my life. I'm in to what God is doing through the church. And so we hope that you'll enjoy this video of another one of those stories of someone sharing how it is that they're into what God is doing in and through them. Hi, I'm Marshall Stone, and I am in. So for me personally, um, I took on the, uh, the challenge, more of a personal type, uh, to become a member of the Serve Ministry team. Um, Becky was very kind. She received my name, reached out to me, and I felt it was the right time to um, up my participation with Incarnation. It had given so much to uh, myself and my family that I felt it was it was a good time, good fit for me to then give back uh, to the Incarnation community. Well, we actually took it to another level. Uh, both my wife and I were um, Sunday school teachers on Wednesdays. So it, and, and you're right, it was a sense of we needed to, to to participate and add to the community that has given us so much and welcomed us. But when we took the step and became the teachers, and we, we've done that for, my wife has done it for three, I've done it for two. Um, that's where we knew we were really giving of ourselves because it was a personal sense that we had. Um, and it really um, was very rewarding. And it's unfortunate we can't do it this year, um, but we're looking forward to being able to do it again in the future. These opportunities and the way that Incarnation has them set up allows us to take in, absorb, but then also give back. And that's how it's been very rewarding for us and how we have found that connection to where we're participating, we're adding to the family of Incarnation. I would recommend group environments, group volunteer opportunities because then it gives you the opportunity to see the community, meet others, get different stories. Because uh, sometimes what you're able to find are those that have been with the Incarnation family for quite some time, and those like myself and my family, which are newer, um, or just a different uh, age brackets. That would be my first thing to say, is that if you're nervous, go into more of a group setting. Set up, you know, where something fall, one of our fall activities and such. I'm in. As we continue in our worship service, we now turn to God in prayer uh, through a prayer of confession. Let's pray together. We gather by the gracious invitation of our God who created us in God's image, our Lord Jesus who showed us how to love, and the spirit that strengthens us for active service. Amen. As followers of Jesus, we have been invited to love our neighbor as Jesus first loved us. Forgive us for not loving well, for holding on to resentment and hurt, for being divided by our fears and failures, for living primarily for ourselves and our own benefit rather than living for the sake of others. By the power of Jesus' forgiving love, your sins are forgiven. Your lives are being made new. The world is being restored. Know this in the deepest part of your being. Your life matters to God and to your neighbor. 
Fill us with your love, O oh God. Move us to be a people who love. Morning Incarnation. My name is Glenn Flo, and I'm a member of Incarnation. I'm not attending worship in person right now, and so I am worshiping online. I am part of the church without walls, and so I am in. Today's reading comes from Colossians chapter 3. As God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the same body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing praises, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Thanks be to God. Well, first I want to say thanks to Glenn Flo for reading our lesson today. Uh, it's been a hard time for people not to be able to be physically present with one another, and so we just tried to find some people that can read, that aren't able to be in this physical space with us, uh, but can continue to be a part of our church without walls. So thanks, Glenn, uh, for your reading today. So we're working in a worship series entitled You Matter. It's our fall worship series. Themes like You Matter, You Matter to God, You Matter to Your Neighbor, and today we're going to focus on you matter, your work matters. 
uh, in our stewardship campaign, so what we as a people of incarnation are going to be making commitments to in this upcoming year, we're including this year not just a financial commitment, but also a serving commitment. And we're doing that for this reason. One, we believe that serving as much as almost anything else helps shape people's minds into the mind of Christ. Jesus in servant mode said, love one another as I have first loved you. And so we're emulating, we're, we're modeling the life of Christ as we serve one another. So there'll be ways that people can serve in the life of this community, but it's also critical for us to understand that wherever we are in our worlds, wherever we are, we are serving as people of Jesus. Wherever we are in the worlds, we're serving as people of Jesus. You heard the lesson that Glenn just read, and it ended with those, what, those words, uh, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, now, what didn't he say? He didn't say, uh, whatever you do at church, do in the name of Jesus. He didn't say, whatever you do on Sunday morning when you're in the gathered community, do it in the name of Jesus. He said this, whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. All of our lives are opportunities to respond as Jesus' people. Uh, Andy Root is a professor at Luther Seminary, and he is, focuses not only on leadership, but also student ministry. And we've asked him to consult with us over the last couple of weeks as we've been making a student ministry transition. And so he worked with some parents, he worked with some of our staff leaders on just not only what's happening in student ministry today, but what we can anticipate as we move forward to the future. And he told this great story the last time we got together. And the story was this. Uh, there was a junior in high school who was uh, just this kind of champion of youth ministry at this particular church. She'd grown up in that place. Uh, she loved it. She moved into leadership roles as she had gotten more connected with the ministry. Uh, she was also a very fine athlete, and so she was an all-conference volleyball player. And so Wednesday nights was the big youth ministry night, and so she would never miss it. She, she would do whatever she could to be there and be present for that ministry. Well, Tuesday night, it just happened to be the regional semifinals for volleyball. And she knew that it was about two hours away that she knew she would have to travel, not only to, to get there, play the game, travel two hours back, probably have some homework on top of that. She knew she would be absolutely wiped out. So she wouldn't be able to either feel physically present or be emotionally present for her Luther League or her uh, youth ministry gathering that next night. And she thought a lot about this. She said, I really want to be present for my youth ministry. And she wrote a note to her coach and she said, hey, I just want to explain something to you. This is really important for me to be connected with my youth ministry. And I know that if I do this uh, volleyball game on uh, Tuesday night, I just won't be able to give my all to it. And so I'm asking that I not play uh, the regional semifinal game for um, our team. And he said, did you see that on Facebook? And we all looked at him, we were like at the edge of our seats, and we said, no, none of us saw that. And he said, well, it's because it never appeared on Facebook. That story is never told. Now, chances are, the reverse has probably happened a lot, which means that people were too tired from a, an athletic event or a school event, and so they chose not to participate in a church activity. Um, but that gives us brings us back to a sense of what do we think our spiritual life includes? And I think that there's a false assumption about who we are as spiritual people that continues to be perpetuated in the life of the church, and I don't think it's helpful. Let me give you a couple of visuals to consider. Uh, the first one is this. The first one is just a pie chart you'll see in front of you, and it has five different components of your life. And you'll see that spiritual is one of the components. I think that's how many people imagine their spiritual life. It's one of many things that we do in our lives. And it looks, we'd think maybe if we could include all of them, we'd have a nice, well-balanced life. Well, the reality is it's not, look, it doesn't look like that. So if you look at the second chart... Uh, where work is about half of it, that's probably closer uh, to what many people experience. It's like consumes a good portion of our life. And you'll notice once work takes over about half, then all of the other parts of your life get smaller and smaller. 
Look at the third pie chart. In the third pie chart, uh, family. So if you have a lot of family obligations and you spend a lot of time just working with your family to make sure that they go here and go there, um, that can consume a good portion of your life. And then what happens is then everything else gets smaller and smaller. And you see in that pie chart, the, the spiritual sliver is like the smallest little one. Because what happens is that when we think about it just as one part of our life, then when all the other parts of our life get overly consuming, that one almost disappears. See, that's the fallacy about thinking about spiritual life as just one component of our life. It separates spiritual things out from other things. So you might be thinking it's really important to be there on Sunday, but Monday is a different experience for me. Or the spiritual life I lead is different than the secular life or the real life that I lead out in the world. And that's just not true. It's just not true. John Ortberg has just a little quick phrase that I think is so helpful. When the first time I heard it, he said this, Jesus is not interested in an abstract thing called your spiritual life. Jesus is interested in your life. He's not just interested in this abstract little portion of your life called your spiritual life. Jesus is interested in your whole life. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus, wherever you you are. So I'm going to have you look at one other uh, pie picture, and it's an actual pie this time, and it looks fantastic, doesn't it? All right, you can imagine just all the ingredients that go into this pie, uh, the flaky crust, the cinnamon topping, the, the choice apples that were used probably to make this pie, the buttery crust that's there. And here's the thing to remember about that image. Rather than the pie chart, which splits everything up into its different components, where do all the ingredients go? They pervade the whole pie. Every single piece of pie that you have tastes the same because it comes from the same place. Whatever you do, wherever you are, do it in the name of Jesus. Now, to continue our uh, the use of that analogy, if you look at the ingredients that Paul might have been talking about in Colossians, look at the list of ingre- ingredients that he uses. He says this, uh, Our life as children of God is comprised of this, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness, love, peace, and thankfulness. It means that there's not a separation between our spiritual life and the rest of our lives. It means that all of our lives, so whether we're home or whether we're at work or whether we're in our community or whether we're gathering with friends, whatever we're doing in life, these are the qualities, these are the ingredients of a Jesus life. Are we living those with compassion and kindness and meekness and forgiveness and love and peace? Whatever you do, Paul says, In word or deed, we do it in the name of Jesus, which means your work matters. Whether your work is in a cubicle or whether it's in a classroom or whether it's in the community or whether it's in your kitchen, your work matters. So I want to take you through two examples, just two different parts of your life, and maybe help you understand how this conception of our spiritual life being a part of everything works itself out. And let's start with work. So about seven or eight years ago in my previous congregation, I just had this gnawing sense that we weren't doing enough to help people in our congregation uh, make the transition from Sunday morning to Monday. Uh, I'd hear oftentimes something like this saying, oh, I love being here. It's so great to be a part of the community. But now I have to go back to my real life. Like there's some dramatic differentiation between Sunday and Monday. And we needed to begin to break that down. So I brought some people together and we started talking about what we were going to do for people just to help them imagine that Monday is part of all of your life, your spiritual life. It's part of the life you've been given to lead. And so we did some studies in some scripture and we look back at, at Genesis and Genesis 1 says that God created the world in six days. God worked for six days and then God rested on the seventh. There's this, in the orders of creation, kind of this built-in rhythm of work and rest, work and rest, and there's a great dignity to that. Genesis 2 said um, there's a way for us to, uh, the humans were given the, the garden and what they were asked to do is to till and to care for the garden. There's work 
And there's dignity that goes along with that work as we are providing not only for ourselves, but providing for one another, providing for the community. And so we began to see that there was this deep sense of a dignity that was part of work, no matter what that work was. But it was still hard for people to sort of release that differentiation between kind of a spiritual thing and a work thing. And I remember actually going to an evangelism conference not long ago where the church was still struggling with this. And um, they were giving you, the people who were involved in that particular workshop, uh, tips as to how to bring Jesus into your workplace. Uh, now, most of these were workplaces where you probably weren't supposed to be, you know, certainly proselytizing, but also just not mentioning religion uh, publicly. And so uh, they were trying to figure out how you could do that uh, without doing that, so to speak. So I just remember this conference, and it, it ended up almost feeling like uh, we were trying to trick people into something. And so I remember them saying that, you know, one of the things to do is this, if you, as a Christian person, you take your Bible and you put it at the end of your desk and you don't say anything about it to anybody. But if somebody asks you, then you can tell them the story about why this is important to you. Or another person said, uh, why don't you get a picture of yourself maybe on a mission trip? And someone will come along and see you in your cubicle and say, hey, uh, what happened there? That's a great picture. What was happening there? And then you get a chance to tell them your story. Uh, another uh, option that they gave us was, hey, you know, if you're meets people at the water cooler or at the coffee pot, uh, they always say, hey, what'd you do this weekend? And so what you can do is say, you know, hey, we did this, and we did this, and, and man, on Sunday morning um, at church, my pastor talked about this in worship, and it was really helpful for me to hear that. And you know, they just hope and pray in the end that people will go, oh, really, what church that is? And then you can engage them in conversation. It all felt like one kind of a trick kind of a, a manipulative way for people to engage people in conversation. But it also was this. It also limited the Jesus um, being in work to words that we say about him. And today we want to be able to expand that sense of how Jesus is present, even in your work, whether you're an accountant or you're a custodian or you work in healthcare, wherever you find yourself in your work, as a person who is a Jesus person, there Jesus can be present. Because think about those ingredients that we talked about earlier. Can you do that work with a sense of compassion for the people that you might be working next to? Can you do it with a sense of humility? Will you do it with a sense of integrity? Martin Luther, our uh, forerunner of the faith, had this great little uh, image. He said this, a Christian shoemaker isn't one who takes uh, shoes and puts a little cross on them so that everybody knows that they're Christian shoes. A Christian shoemaker just makes good shoes. They make good shoes. There's a sense of integrity about the work that they do, and they do them for the benefit of the person that will receive whatever product that they're giving. 400 years later, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was in Memphis, Tennessee, and it was just a few days before he died. And he uh, was speaking to the sanitation workers because they were planning on going on strike. And he had this, what I think was a very profound statement about how we recognize people in our culture and the ultimate dignity of all of our work. He said this, but let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity, it has dignity and it has worth. One day our society must come to see this. One day our society will come to respect the sanitation worker if it is to survive. For the person who picks up our garbage in the final analysis is as significant as the physician for if they don't do their job, diseases are rampant. So all labor has dignity. All labor has dignity. Friends, your work matters. Whether it's in a, a cubicle or a classroom or in the community or in the kitchen, your work matters. Because in the end, it's not about what you do. It's about how you do it. And you do it with the ingredients of compassion and kindness and gentleness, and love, and peace. So I've got one more that I want to run by you, and it's very pertinent for this moment in time. It's about politics. 
And I want to talk about Christians and politics. Uh, oftentimes, people will say to me, especially as a leader, but though I've heard it said that Christian and Christianity and politics don't and shouldn't mix with one another. Uh, I'm going to disagree, and I'm going to disagree uh, for this reason. Politics, if you think about what it is, you know, goes back even Aristotle when he began to write about it in his book uh, Politica. Uh, it just simply meant the affairs of the city. It means how do we organize ourselves so that for the well-being of the people who are in our communities? How are we going to structure our life in such a way that the well-being of our community is nurtured rather than harmed? So that's really what politics is if you break it down. It's a communal way for us to say, are we going to help people or are we going to harm people by how we organize our lives? So let me ask you this question. Do you believe God has any sense of interest in the ways that we help people or harm people. I think God is deeply invested in that. How are we gonna organize our lives so that we perpetuate a system that helps and assists and supports as many of us as possible? So that's really what politics is all about. And it's our participation in how the community is gonna go about that process of supporting the well being. Will we be helpful? or we be harmful in how we organize ourselves. And let me give you another sense of why it's important for us to, to be engaged on that level, especially as Jesus people these days. Uh, one is this, we can say to ourselves, let's go back to the issue of, of let's, the care for creation. If you look at the biblical mandate, the biblical mandate going back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is that we are people who have been given dominion, but dominion not to use the earth for whatever we choose, but to dominion to care for the earth. This is the way that we've been charged to interact with our created world because we're part of it. And its benefit works for our benefit. And so a care of creation has been part of the, the biblical witness from the very beginning. And so we can say as a Christian person, I'm going to do my part in that and I'm going to recycle and I'll be very conscious about uh, the use that I have of, of materials and I won't be wasteful. So we could go about and do our individual things. Great. I'd encourage that. Well done. But think about that in contrast or in comparison to if we don't do anything, for instance, to regulate uh, emissions that come out of cars or toxins that are spewed by industries into the air or toxins that are spewed into the groundwater or the lakes and the streams around us because there is no way for our community to say anything about what's good or bad in regard to creation. That's why it's critical for us to engage not only our individual lives as Jesus people, but also to be able to say, how is the community for the sake of the creation going to be able to work together for help to benefit what's going on? Case study one. Uh, second one is, and this is an uh, important one for us in the Twin Cities and, and actually globally, but uh, especially for us in the Twin Cities. This last, you know, May, we were just struck and overwhelmed by the death of George Floyd. And all of that meant for us to have to deal with and wrestle with the racial inequalities uh, in our lives. And so at first, you can say, and I had many people in conversation say, uh, I'm not a racist person. Uh, I love all people for who they are. I believe that we're all made in the image of God. And um, I do the best that I can to, to support people, you know, individually. All that's great. It's fantastic. What we discovered along the way was this, though, is that after you kind of peeled back the layers of the onions, is that there's communal, structural, uh, systemic things that have been part of our country for a long, long time and are still part of our lives yet today that keep people, in this case, black people, from experiencing the full kind of life that many other people, primarily white people, experience in our country. Even in my lifetime, I think about this. Um, Jim Crow laws were still part of the Southern experience and other places in the country. Um, voting rights just happened after I was born even um, for black Americans. Um, 
redlining happened in the Twin Cities, and so there are neighborhoods that people, black people, weren't uh, allowed to get a loan to move into those particular neighborhoods. All of these things are systemic things. They're, they're the way that we structure ourselves as a community. And I can do all of the individual work that, that I want, and all of it's good and right and beneficial. But I think God also says, who are we going to be as a community? And is the way that we're structuring ourselves, our common life with one another, does it benefit those people that I love? See, you have to go back again to think about in, in engaging any kind of decision-making in the political sphere and say, who are we as Jesus' people? So you invest back into Jesus' life and say, what, was his, what were the characteristics that were important for us to understand? You, you go back to Luke 4, his mission statement. First thing that came out of his mouth in the synagogue that day was, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor. So you have to ask you questions. Are we, are we organizing our common life so that those who are disadvantaged in the sense of wealth and well-being will have an opportunity. We have to ask those questions. You look at his life and you find out all the ways that he was, he was welcoming of people that the religious and the cultural society kept at the edges, edges. And we say, are we organizing our common life in such a way that those who would maybe normally feel on the edge or in the periphery, they have a place at the table? Those are conscious decisions that we can make as communities? Are we living as people with one another with the ingredients that Paul talked about in Colossians 3? And this is an important decision point for all the people who are involved in these processes. Are they people of compassion and kindness and mercy and humility? And are they driven by love and peace and forgiveness? Friends, your work matters. Your work matters in your home. Your work matters in the, the hallways of, of government buildings. Your work matters in the hallways uh, of a school building. Your work matters. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg died, and uh, she was a champion of equality. And so there's so many people who are writing and finding things that she had written that were inspiring to them. And one of the ones that she wrote, I think, captures the sense in some ways of what we're talking about today. And it's a very inspiring thing for me to read. And I want to share those words as we close. If you want to be a true professional, so if, as you think about your work, whatever that work is in the world, you will do something outside of yourself, something to repair tears in your community, something to make life a little better for people less fortunate than you. That's what I think a meaningful life is. Living not for oneself, but for one's community. Isn't that beautiful? A Jewish woman in 2020, echoing the words of our Jewish rabbi about 2,000 years ago. You do, friends, matter a lot to God. You matter to your neighbor, and your work matters. Because in the end, and you've heard me say this over and over again, I don't believe that Jesus came so that we can build bigger and better churches. I believe that Jesus came to help us imagine first and then co-create, participate in making a better world. Amen.
pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, we are reminded again of the great tasks you have set before us, ways in which we can participate with you and what you're already doing in our midst. Our hearts are united as one in your spirit, even though we are physically apart from each other. Paul's call to action to the church in Colossae rings true still today. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so we recommit our hands to your service. We recommit our minds to your service. We recommit our voices to your service. We recommit our whole selves to your service. Regardless of where we find ourselves today or tomorrow or the next day, we are your instruments to be used in bringing about your kingdom here on earth healer and protector. We give you thanks for all the ways in which you have shown us your power this past week. We thank you for the gifts of new life you give us each and every week, for the glimpses of hope we find in the restoration of a broken relationship or the positive outcome of a treatment that we are receiving or just in the beauty that we see through creation as we find ourselves caught up in a new season. In this moment, we lift up to you those in our community for whom darkness and hopelessness have settled in. As our loved ones recover from surgery or receive a devastating diagnosis, we pray for those who find themselves isolated and alone, for those struggling with depression or addiction. Come and bring hope in their lives. Shine your light in the darkest corners of our hearts and remind us that we are your beloved clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Sustainer and provider, you are the one who grants us all that we need. While it can be easier sometimes to focus on ourselves and our own needs, you sustain us and provide us with, the, with abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Whether that be through the gifts of time, talent, or treasure, you grant us with overflowing hearts, to serve other people. Continue to sustain and provide for all our essential workers who give more and more of themselves each and every day. We thank you for the gift of this faith community and the ways in which our lives intersect with one another in order to lift each other up. May everything that we do in word or in deed be for your glory. Amen. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so, remembering me. In the same manner, after they had eaten supper, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. As often as you drink of it, do so, remembering me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 
taste and see that the Lord is good. Friends, remember, you matter to God, to us, and to the world. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for worshiping with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.